On the 7th of September 2007, a young boy was watching television on a station called CBeebies, a government-funded station owned by the BBC that was advertised as the main hub for completely innocent children's media. Or at least, that's what he thought. Children's media is commonly associated with some of the most wholesome memories you will have as a child. Getting up at 6am to catch the startup of Milkshake, staying up late to catch the newest Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles on Nickelodeon, and racing home from school to be on time for the new Thomas the Tank Engine episode. But what if I told you that there was an entirely different side to children's media that no one ever talks about? A side that has caused endless sleepless nights for thousands of children across the globe. A side that killed a man. Today we're going to be diving into six pieces of media that absolutely terrified the children of its generation and the long-lasting effects it had on them. Jigsaw was a children's variety program which ran from 1979 to 1984 and usually involved simple and silly antics from the main cast. However, one supporting character from the series was notorious for being a symbol of pure fear and terror for children. A character known as Mr. Nosybonk. While obviously not the intention, Mr. Nosybonk's design is nothing short of terrifying. Something I think makes the design so unsettling was the huge bulging eyes, something that is strangely frequent in controversial children's media. While Mr. Nosybonk's role in the series was relatively minimal, his immense cultural impact is undeniable. After the series ended in 1984, Mr. Nosybonk became merely a distant yet haunting memory of children of that era. As the years went on though, conversations started to stir up about him once again. In the mid to late 2000s, Mr. Nosybonk was both satirized and reminisced on in multiple pieces of media. The most notable one being Charlie Brooker's Screen Wipe, where he thinks back on the character and in his words, the character struck him as someone who would sneak into a stranger's bedroom in the dead of night and knife you. And knife you. And knife you. On Halloween night of 1992, a mockumentary simply known as Ghost Watch was aired on the BBC. It followed presenters Michael Parkinson, Sarah Green, her husband Mike Smith, and Craig Charles, investigating a reported poltergeist in the most haunted house in Britain. While it was clearly stated as being merely a piece of fiction, the after effects of the program are nothing short of harrowing. After and while the program was being aired, the BBC received hundreds of worried phone calls from parents in which both them and their children were utterly mortified at what they were being shown. What made this whole ordeal so much worse is that when parents would call the BBC to check if the broadcast was fake, they would be met with an engaged line, leading them to believe that the whole thing was real. After Ghostwatch aired, children across the UK were left harrowed some of which reported to have nightmares every day for a month afterwards. However, the most notable incident that was caused by Ghostwatch was the death of an 18-year-old boy. Just five days after Ghostwatch aired, a boy named Martin Denham took his own life and in his pocket left a note saying, If there are ghosts, I will now be one, and I will always be with you as one. Razzle Dazzle was a short-lived musical children's program that first aired in June of 2005 and has subsequent reruns until February of 2008. It ran for two seasons and aired on the BBC children's block CBeebies. The series followed the titular character of Razzle Dazzle, 
as he learnt about many different kinds of sounds. Seems harmless enough, right? Well, no. One morning in 2007, a young man named Sean Hickman was watching CBeebies as per normal. Everything seemed completely fine, until a show called Razzle Dazzle came on the air. While looking back on it now, certain parts are fuzzy. I distinctly remember being creeped out by the opening title of the show. That ominous, airy part where all the children say Razzle Dazzle's name in sync felt demonic and somewhat ritual-esque. According to my mother, the second the character appeared, I screamed and cried like she had never seen before. At first she tried to comfort me, but nothing would work. I ran to my bedroom and was uncontrollably bawling. After around 15 minutes of her cradling me and putting Thomas the Tank Engine on to calm me down, I finally stopped. What's weird about this whole thing though is that this still haunts me to this day. Whenever I try to recount this story, my eyes start to water. I know it's not crying as I would be able to tell, but my body just has that reaction to it. When I tell my friends this story, a lot of them believe that my eye watering is a symptom of some kind of PTSD. I don't know if I believe that personally, but either way, looking at that character still gives me chills to this day. Well nowadays, creepypastas are treated as a complete joke. Back in the early 2010s, they were the source of unrivaled fear for children, who had way too much exposure to the internet. The most prolific creepypastas of them all though, are Jeff the Killer, a young man who was violently bullied, had acid thrown in his face, and then murdered his entire family. Slenderman, an eerie boogeyman who appeared in vintage photos of primarily children. And Tails Doll, a homicidal video game character come to life, and will kill anyone who dares to do the Tails Doll ritual. The main way children were exposed to these frightening characters was of course, through YouTube. Before the days of YouTube Kids, YouTube was an immensely diverse and accessible website. While there were a few exceptions, you could be of any age and watch videos like this. And so it won't come as a surprise to you that a lot of children during this period were exposed to some extremely disturbing things. Creepypastas like Slenderman and Jeff the Killer became so prolific that it ended up leading to the attempted murder of a 12 year old girl. On May 31st, 2014, two 12 year old girls, Anissa and Morgan, lured their friend Peyton into a forest and stabbed her 19 times in an attempt to appease the fictional character known as Slenderman. When questioned, Morgan, who was one of the killers, was not the slightest remorseful, and while Anissa was more so than her accomplice, they both stated that the attack was needed to appease Slenderman. From the information that was gathered by authorities, the two girls were deemed as mentally unstable and were committed to mental health institutions for sentences of 25 years to life and 40 years to life. However, after seven years, Anissa was granted early release and would be under supervision until age 37. While it's hard to say what the long-lasting effects of Elsa Gate and Momo are due to their recency, the effects they had on children in the moment are still quite disturbing. Elsa Gate was an incident that occurred on YouTube Kids in 2017. It involved people dressing up as child-friendly characters such as Spider-Man, Elsa, Anna, and Hulk, and doing some really inappropriate things. The issue arose when a BBC article was published that addressed thousands of parents concerned with what their children were watching. One parent said that they heard extremely worrying noises from their child's bedroom, and found their child watching videos of Peppa Pig with her mouth gaping open at a dentist as well as an animation of Elsa completely nude in the bath. While this topic isn't particularly disturbing, the next one is utterly shocking. The Momo Challenge was an internet phenomenon dated back to 2018 that terrified not only children, but adults alike. 
You may be wondering how such a disturbing image was exposed to children so easily. And much like Elsa Gate, it all leads back to YouTube. For unknown reasons, an unnerving amount of YouTube kids videos were played with jump scare type moments where Momo would pop up on seemingly innocent videos, and then on the screen, it would demand children to harm and in some cases kill themselves. And if they didn't, Momo would hunt them down and kill them. This to me is a byproduct of children of new generations being far too exposed to the internet now. It's not uncommon for children to seek out more dark and edgy things at a certain age, but when they stumble across things like this, it has the potential to become deadly. Mama, mama, mama's going to kill you. Mama, mama, mama's going to kill you.